If you are a person, and I'm guessing you are, you have had to tell someone you love a big and scary thing. At least once. It's part of the human condition. Maybe you've had to tell your supportive spouse that you flunked out of med school. Again. Maybe you had to explain to your grandparents why you brought a boyfriend and a girlfriend to Cousin Gabe's bar mitzvah. Or maybe you've had to reveal to Papa that you're in an awful mess, but you've made up your mind and you're keeping the baby. And you don't mean maybe. We reveal these truths to our people because the alternative is often way worse. Even if you manage to skillfully avoid the telling, if you're like me, the secret you're hiding will devour you from the inside. And that's no fun at all. Because I did not want the gnawing feeling of withholding to consume me, it was time to reveal my autistic truth to my family. A year after my diagnosis, but still, at least I was doing it, or thinking about doing it. Now, I like to control for every possible outcome when I am telling people things, so I couldn't go into the big reveal without some preparation. I had to do some practicing first. What am I doing? We're role-playing. Okay. Okay. Make it be dad. I'll be mom. That's gross. But anyway, we'll just try it. Ew. Why don't you be I'm with dad? my girlfriend, Hannah, and her son, Jacob. We're at a noisy um, food hall, pretending okay, to be my family okay. when I do my big autistic what reveal. Like, what if I just, like, say, like, hey, guys, I just want to let you know that I was diagnosed with autism a year ago. Bye. And I leave the room. No. Like, I run out of the room. What if I just write it on a piece of paper and hand it to them? I, yeah. Oh, I do the cards from, like, um... Love Actually. Love Actually. I do the Love Actually cards. It's like A, U, T. Right. And they're like, she's... She's... An auteur. She's an auteur. <laughs> PowerPoint presentation. Oh, my God. PowerPoint is. How hilarious would that be? Can you imagine? What would it be What called? would the first slide be? Uh... I wasn't being serious, but I mean... Wait, actually, no, I know, it's, but I'm not going to do it because it seems like a lot of work. What if we did it okay, I know this isn't role-playing in the classical what sense, but still, it working it from all sides, or ridiculous or not, or is helping. Okay. It just takes the heaviness right. out of it. What are, our, what are our options on the table? No, uh, what about, a, like, a interpretive dance? Uh, no. Autistic dance? What does that even look like? So no to interpretive dance. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have any real answers. What if what if I do like a like a mime routine, like I mime it, what, or like charades? I just don't have any serious answers. No, I know. I'm, I mean, look, if you don't have any serious answers, you don't have any serious answers. Because really, the only serious answer is to be direct and open-hearted, even though it's scary as hell. My inner therapist would tell me to try to understand why telling my family I am autistic fills me with dread. What's the worry? And how can I honor that anxiety without succumbing to it? I mean, I guess part of it is, like, you have to think the best of people, right? Like, in order to mitigate your own anxiety, you have to kind of be like, these people are my family, they love me in a particular way, and hopefully... Like, whatever I talk to them about, I'm not telling them, like, I'm going to jail, you know, or I committed a crime. It's like, there's two ways to go in. One is, like, self-protective. Like, I have to set boundaries and protect myself because, like, this isn't going to go well. It's like if you're telling your evangelical parents that you're gay or something. Like, that's one way to go in. And another way to go in is, like, I, I, like, just clean-minded, like, clear-minded And a third way to go in would be, like, expect the best. So that's the spectrum. I was really split about this. One voice in my head was telling me, just get on with it already, you giant baby. Tell your family. What's the big deal? And the other voice was like, oh, yeah, no, this is going to go very badly indeed. And that's reflective of our family dynamics. See, my family is a particular kind of supportive, If I needed to get out of a legal jam or I wanted help painting my apartment or planting my garden, then, yeah, they're all about it. And that's not nothing. But we don't all sit around and gas bag about our feelings. Emotional problem solving really isn't our jam. But 
if I was going to divulge, it was going to have to get emotional. You're listening to The Loudest Girl in the World, who is not that granny in line with you at the bakery telling you all about her favorite types of lemon bars. It's me, Lauren Ober. The Loudest Girl in the World is a show about finding yourself broken in a pretty dark place and emerging from that place a mostly glued back together person. A few weeks before Thanksgiving, my producer Ryder put an event on my calendar for November 25th. The name of the event was Shruggy Emoticon Upside Down Question Mark Lauren Comes Out to Family Question Mark Shruggy Emoticon. I mean, Ryder put so much care and thought into the event title, how could I back out? At this point, I had already told Hana and a handful of friends, and I was even many months into making this actual show. And I still hadn't told the Obers, but I had to. So part of this process, both in the making of the podcast and also just IRL in your life, is you telling your parents. That's Ryder, audio producer to the stars. How do you feel about that? It feels super scary for reasons that I can't quite put my finger on, but which maybe you can help me put my finger on. It feels, mm, I don't know. It just feels like a little bit old to be having a revelation for your parents, you know? Well, that's just ages towards me. There's no right age to come out about anything. But real talk, I'm just not good at having hard conversations about me, which Ryder knows because she's heard me have a million of them, each one more embarrassing than the next. That's one sort of hallmark for me is that, like, it's a lot of, like, I'm telling you a thing, but I'm not actually inviting any questions. And With this, you want something different. Well, sure? I feel like I don't know. I mean, my my gut feels like I just want to, like, tell them and then, like, run away. You know, I think it's because I worry about the judgment that I don't want to have to face the judgment. Like, I want to tell you the thing, but I don't want to be judged for it. And then I, it's like too vulnerable to engage with it. Mm -hmm. What kind of judgments do you think might come up? I guess I worry that they'd be like, what are you talking about? You know, the same as I've had for other people, Mm -hmm. you know, sort of no, you're not. Like, you're fine. You have a job, this, that, the all of the things that people with a subtle autism presentation experience. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you tell people something like that, it's not just yours anymore. It becomes the other person's story or bit of information and they get to decide what they want to do with that. And if they want to ignore it, they can, if they want to engage with it in a positive way. Like there are lots of choices that people have when somebody tells them something. And so Mm -hmm. I think part of it for me is that there's too much that I can't anticipate. Like I have massive anticipatory anxiety, even just talking about this and thinking about the prospect of it, even though you're making me do it. You know, it's like very stressful (laughs) to think about. Ryder is making me do it, and I will hold it against her for the rest of my days. But also, I am a person with agency, and this is important for me to do. Ryder and I agreed that the day after Thanksgiving, I would have some chat skis with Kathy, Russ, and RJ, a.k.a. mom, dad, and brother. So much for me bum-rushing the Best Buy on Black Friday, I would instead be telling my family a hard thing. Thanks, Ryder. I emailed the family and told them I had something I wanted to tell them about. I let them know that the topic was a sensitive one for me. That's what my buddy, Anna Sale, author of the book, Let's Talk About Hard Things, told me to do. Christ almighty, just writing that little email out was hard. Now I actually have to go through with telling them the hard thing? It would have been better if they had all declined because they were busy perming their hair or organizing their paperweight collection or something. But everyone agreed to stick around after dinner, so I had to go through with it. 
Or did I? A few days before Thanksgiving, I called up my pal Becca in hopes that she might be able to ease my nerves around the whole situation. Becca is my ex-partner, and yes, we're still great friends, and yes, I know that's a lesbian stereotype. Big whoop. What kind of soup are you making? I am making a, like a red lentil, like nothing special, but it is quite flavorful, and it's it's very soup season right now. It's very, like, like, I, like, blah, everything is terrible. I'd been feeling really bad about the weather turning and endless COVID and how hard this journey of reckoning had been. And I was being a real Eeyore off his meds about it. But Becca knew the right thing to say. If you go and you come out to your parents and it's hard and you, it will probably be hard or your, their reactions make you feel bad, you can just call me. Well, I really appreciate that. I mean, I, I, I will. So I had a plan. I emailed my family to let them know I wanted to have a conversation with them. My autism support human slash girlfriend, Hannah, was down to be there with me. And Becca offered her emotional phone-a-friend support. So I was well on my way to gathering up all my courage and stealing myself for the great autism reveal of 2021. But then I had a very intense setback. I fully melted down. The bad feelings really dug in on this one. It happened the day before Hannah and I drove to Pittsburgh for the holiday. I was racing to finish a work project and feeling generally overwhelmed by the prospect of heading out of town because nothing grinds my gears quite like a highway rest stop before a holiday. Also, I remembered that it was exactly one year since my diagnosis. Naturally, I had some feelings about that. So we had all the ingredients for a deluxe-sized meltdown. Because I've gotten into the habit of documenting myself being a saddo, I pulled out my phone and hit record. Today is the diagnosis anniversary. It's one year since I got my results back. And this is not the state that I wanted to be in when... You know, a year later, still trying to figure out how to process this and even how to, like, tell my family. And I think I have to um, abort the mission because um, I don't think it's wise in this time to try to shoehorn something like that in at, at, a, at a very at a time that's already going to be quite stressful um, for everyone. I really felt like I needed to pack it in. This was not my time. My brother and sister-in-law were traveling to Pittsburgh for the first time with my two-year-old nephew, and my mom had just gotten a puppy. So three-quarters of my family was already preloaded for maximal anxiety. Even if it wasn't a holiday, it was already a powder keg just waiting for a spark. I texted Ryder and told her I couldn't go through with it. It was just too much to tell my family en masse. I would rather eat a barrel of arugula with a chaser of capers than sit mom, dad, and little brother down to tell them this. I could maybe handle it if I did it one by one. But not all in a group, no way. My stress level was at an 11 just considering the proposition. Ryder wrote back that it was no big deal and I should take my time with it. Girlfriend Hannah, on the other hand, was not going to let me off the hook. She was like, don't be a weensicle. You're doing it. I mean, sometimes you just need a person to push you out of an airplane when you're skydiving for the first time. Hannah is that person. So, after the break, I free fall into the great autism reveal of 2021. And it goes, well, you'll see. I have never cared much for holidays. They're always too unpredictable, too unwieldy, too sad, too prescribed, just too much. And they always kick up a huge cloud of anxiety for me. So right off the bat, Thanksgiving isn't my favorite day, and not just because of its genocidal origin story. Also, Thanksgiving is an eating holiday, and eating is not one of my favorite hobbies. 
Also, I'm a vegetarian, so turkey, stuffing, and gravy will never touch my plate. One of the only things I actually like about this particular holiday is the jellied cranberry sauce in a can that no one else in my family will eat but me. Also, green beans. I love green beans. I really enjoy beans. I think it's good. Beans? No, I like green beans. Like, Hannah makes amazing green beans. I really like to use green beans. That is the one thing my children gladly eat for their entire time. I think they're one of the best. To me, they're the best vegetables. But Hannah makes these crispy green beans with, like, a Dijon. What what is the sauce? I I think we had them at your house. I've made that 10,000 times. Yeah, we had them at your house. Oh, yeah, that's right. And if that isn't riveting dinner conversation fair, I don't know what is. Other dinner table topics included my nephew's daycare. So he, we pay extra for him to go on the tumble bus. That's cute. The provenance of Hannah's rugs. Oh, I do buy a lot on Etsy, though. And a jacket Hannah and I saw on a visit to Marshall's earlier in the day. The color was like a mauve puce. It was not attractive. It was like a fancy brick. We also chatted briefly about the foods my mother cannot stand. Yeah. Now, what about eggplant, which seems also oh. similarly yeah, all watery. Not as watery. Not as watery. Oh, that and sweet potatoes. Yeah, they're the things that really grab me. That P.S. Kathy's fibbing big time. Her list of off-limits foods includes basically all dishes flavored with curry powder, cumin, and cardamom, and anything with a whiff of watermelon. Anyway, I was glad for all this Thanksgiving small talk. It helped distract me from the anxiety fog that was rapidly descending on me. But at some point, the meal had to end, and I just had to get on with it. So after a delicious dessert of cranberry sauce from a can for me and homemade pumpkin pie for everyone else, we cleaned up the dinner, sent my nephew to bed, and reconvened around the table. And then it was time. It was just my dad, Russ, my mom, Kathy, and my brother, RJ. No in-laws, no step-parents. And, of course, Hannah was there doing her best Autismo Junior stand-in routine. Oh, how I long for Autism Pleasantville in this moment. We were all sitting around my mom's tiger maple dining room table. Hannah to my right, Russ caddy corner to my left, mom and brother directly across from me. My two recorders were like table centerpieces, awkwardly perched between us. Russ is a lawyer, so he couldn't help but look like he was primed to rebut opposing counsel's arguments. RJ is a cool guy, so he was leaning back in his chair, enjoying a beer. Kathy, the quiet one, sat neatly with her hands folded in her lap. The mood was one of curious bemusement. I started the conversation off in a way that Anna Sale, I'm pretty sure, would not have endorsed, with a lazy, half-hearted joke. I feel, like, very nervous about this, and I feel like, like, you know, it's, this is, like, a hard thing to talk about uh, for me, and I just wanted to let you guys know that I'm gay. <laughs> you know, I've no. known that for quite a while. Just kidding. Oh, my just kidding. Lord, what a bombshell. Just kidding. Yeah. Um, Somebody kill me now. So, so basically, like, I had been feeling for a long time, like, like, something, like, was off, like, mental health wise, or it wasn't quite like, just was overly sensitive or lots of things felt like, just not like flowing right. And then, you know, I would talk to my therapist about it and, um, and you know, it didn't like, it didn't seem anything, you know, like diagnosable or, or whatever. And then, um, and then when the pandemic happened, I kind of like, lost my shit. I mean, you know how this spiel goes. You've heard it before, and at this point, I've repeated it a bunch of times. I should have been sort of on autopilot, but I wasn't. I was parsing through every word so, so carefully, trying to be as specific as possible. I didn't want there to be any confusion about what I was saying. Listening back to the tape, I realized I don't fully remember this moment. At some point in the telling, I think I just dissociated. Not clinically. Just that my words were trying to thread the finest of needles while my brain was sizzling in my skull. I couldn't make eye contact, though that's no big surprise. 
I just kept looking at this weird print of a crow wearing boots that Kathy had hanging over her mantle. On the recording, I noticed my voice is uncharacteristically thin and shaky. And so I ended up um, going to a psychologist uh, and, and taking a number of tests for uh, autism. And, um, and I have an autism diagnosis. Oh, man. I did it. I revealed my hard thing. Um, and so I wanted to tell you guys about that because obviously you're my family and I love you. And I've been trying to figure out how to navigate like the next 43 years of my life, knowing that the troubles that I was having and the things that are difficult, a lot of them can be chalked up to this diagnosis. In retrospect, this would have been a great moment for me to pause and wait for a response. But that's not what happened. I kept going. I was basically like a human Wikipedia page for autism. I told them everything I knew about the condition, about cultural tropes and the underdiagnosis of girls and women and the mental health challenges that can go hand in hand with autism. Then, after talking at them for 11 straight minutes, also not something Anna Sale would endorse, I waited for someone to respond. Finally, my mom Kathy tapped in. Well, I think it's very brave of you to, to talk about it. I, don't, I see that it's very painful for you to go through this and to talk to your family about it. Mm-hmm. I really get that. Mm-hmm. And it makes me sad, too. Um, and personally, I really don't know much about autism mm-hmm. or Asperger's. Mm-hmm. Um, I really don't think I know anyone other than Jacob. Mm-hmm. And um, so I don't have any basis to make a comment on how you fit in to that diagnosis mm-hmm. or that I understand it because I don't. Yeah. Don't. Listening to this months later, I don't know so much that it's brave to tell my family I'm autistic. Sure, it's scary and sure, there are stakes. But more than anything, the reveal seems post-brave. I don't even really seem to have that much control over it. The reveal felt imperative, as if I was compelled by a force larger than myself that I cannot see or name to show the full measure of my humanity to the people who raised me. In that way, the revelation feels every bit as critical as breathing air or drinking water— but exponentially more terrifying. Because you're asking to be seen. And how many of us truly feel seen? Luckily, right off the bat, Kathy seemed to at least try to see. I mean, some of the things that you were saying, um, I really, I agree with, I see. I see your sensitivity to noise and I see your sensitivity to smells and textures. You always have had that. Right. For me, I always was aware that there was some issue. Mm-hmm. I didn't have a name for it. I didn't understand it. I knew you were struggling. Yeah. And I had no idea that it was part of mm-hmm. an autism yeah. issue. I didn't have the knowledge to to know what it might be, or to even think to take you for testing. I mean, I just, it wasn't a thing we did. Nobody would have back then. Little girls like me didn't register as kids who needed support or accommodations. So I can hardly blame my parents for not getting me help. Because what help was there to get? I don't really remember how I felt when my mom said these words because dissociation. But hearing them now, I feel heartened. I appreciate that in the moment, Kathy could mirror at least some of my challenges. It meant that she was at least trying to engage with what I was ham-handedly telling them. I continued explaining to my family the ins and outs of autism and the way my movement through the world was so much different than theirs. Like, the sensitivity goes way beyond. And it's like, I've learned that a lot of, like, my, like, anger... And, and sort of aggression or hostility probably come from both the anxiety of having so many feelings and not an understanding of how to express them, 
but also there's a thing that um, particularly women who are autistic do is like you're trying so hard to do all of the right things you're trying hard to communicate in the way that everybody else does and you're trying hard to fix your body and your face and all of these things you're thinking about them all the time and then it is absolutely exhausting and you're just laid out at this point i was sweating through my pants and trying desperately to sit still and not rock back and forth while the three of them stared back at me My dad, Russ, is the scariest starer in the history of staring. He's a trial lawyer and a former prosecutor, and I'm pretty sure he could stare me into an admission of guilt for a crime I most assuredly did not commit. So just picture a man boring his eyeballs into the back of your brain when you hear this. So now that you've revealed this to us, Mm -hmm. how would you like us to treat you differently from the way we've treated you in the past? Well, I don't think it's any differently. I appreciate the question. I mean, I think it's more just like an understanding of like how I move through the world and how I have moved through the world for the last like 43 years, um, which is that like things have been very hard. And, you know, I've had a real jagged work history and, and I'm not saying it's because of that necessarily, but like, you know, and even though, like, I work hard and I work hard and I work hard, like, I often feel like I'm beating my head against a wall. And I've, you know, I've had some, like, really bad, dark times around that. And and um, so just sort of knowing, like, yeah, like, I have a little bit of a different neurology. And it doesn't require, like, anybody to do anything or just, like, it's just an understanding, I think. As we continued, I started to feel like they got it, or at least we were scratching the surface. Russ asked me about my coping strategies and workplaces, and I told him how I'd instituted a rule where I no longer work with incompetent assholes. Also therapy. Lots of therapy. We dipped into my executive functioning challenges with punctuality and memory, and we talked about emotional dysregulation and the anger that comes from routinely being misunderstood. It seemed like it was going okay. I mean, I still wanted to bolt out of the room, but at least it was less awkward than the start. Then, some number of beers in, my brother RJ confronted me about the impact my anger had on him. Me, I was just a little kid starting to like kind of understand yeah. the world around me. I was looking up to you all the time. Yeah. And that intolerance for, you know, a sound or a habit or a behavior that often was coming from me yeah. came out in like extreme aggression and, yeah. it, and it made me think like, what the fuck is wrong with me? No, I mean, I it, it, is, it is, like, I remember like, you used to wear your keys on your belt. You, not a great look. Admittedly. Not a great look now. But no, my chairs bear the scars, let me tell but, you. But like, the sound of the keys jingling was like unmanageable for me and i would be like like it builds up it builds up it builds up and then it gets really trying personal when it, it comes really personal, out yeah but yeah. you're trying to tamp it down it's like you would be listening to your music and i could hear the music bleeding out and you're trying and you're trying and trying to ignore it try to ignore it try to ignore it try to ignore it and then it bubbles over and it comes out probably as aggressive and I feel terrible about that but I remember all of those moments I remember one time Kathy was singing in the car in a low sing and I could not I hate it I hate it so much it's 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 if she's black if she's singing so loud it would not bother me at all it's the low, it's low, it, it, it's a frequency thing, It's a, and you can't control it. If I could control that, if I could ignore those things, I totally would. Why, do, why does anybody want to be saddled with that? Nobody wants to be thinking about those things all the time. It's awful. And so, yeah, like, you're suppressing all of that, and then when the bubble over, it's like awful. You don't want to be yelling at somebody for their headphones or their keys jangling. Like, I feel terrible, like that it, it comes off as like, who the fuck is this person? What's wrong with them? Like, shut up about it. But you probably didn't have that reaction with, with people who were younger than you very often. That was me. Where it's like, I don't know what's right. 
this person's older than me and oh, they're telling sure. me everything is wrong. Sure. Those are some hard pills to swallow. My brother had clearly been holding on to some stuff for many, many years. And I feel awful about that. Truly, I do. But I also can't help the way my brain works, the way some sounds just send my body into fight mode. Because in the fight, flight, or freeze paradigm of self-protection, I am a fighter. And if I had known then what I know now, well, then we'd all be in a better place. Hindsight's a real jerk. So we should probably take a little break to process. So turns out it's not that easy to field comments and questions and critiques from the family. Thankfully, my stand-in emotional support human, Hana, was there to ease the tension and pinch hit a few questions. Can I ask you guys, does anybody, any of you see anything, I mean, I know this is all new, but anything that you remember throughout all of your years of being in a family in the foreign that now you, that, that you would reevaluate or think of differently? Well, of course it was a whole school thing. I mean, her, quote, disruptive behavior, there was no mean intent behind it. She could not manage herself in a classroom setting and not not being able to be the one who was talking. Um, that always stood out. And also, through the years in her jobs, um, having difficulties in every work environment with one particular person or another. And it's what you said. It was They were incompetent. They couldn't do their job. And they were telling you to do something that you could do better or that you knew wasn't right. Those are the things that's the two big things that stand out for me. What about other kids? Just out of curiosity. Um, Lauren had a difficult time connecting with kids always mm -hmm. from the time she was young when, when we would have play dates and stuff. And she'd want to play her own thing. And the girls that came over would want to do something different. Even now, as a person with 40 plus years in the can, it's hard to hear that I sucked at play dates. Because I was a genuinely lonely kid. I spent a lot of time by myself. If it weren't for my athletic abilities and the fact that I was on a million teams, I'm pretty sure I would have gone my entire childhood with no real peer interaction. I just didn't really know how to friend. As we were getting to the end of our chat, my younger brother RJ asked a question. This has been like a process of understanding yourself that's mm -hmm. been going on for a while. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious how it compares to you know, 20 years removed, your experience coming out. Oh, because <laughs> you started this with a joke, like, oh, guys, I'm gay. No, I know. I mean, this is kind of a coming out. Sure, it is. I, to think of it as like, I mean, it sounds cheesy to say, but just sort of like letting in, like, I don't feel like I'm revealing anything that I like feel ashamed of or anything like that. I feel like we're all, we're all on the same page. You know, I remember with great clarity you and I having that first conversation. Oh yeah. And I remember I telling you're you. A deli or I remember something. telling you that I, you know, I love you and yeah. I, I just want you to be happy. And I feel the same way right now. Yeah. It doesn't mean anything. Anything. In terms no. of how we feel or treat you. In that moment, after I said what I needed to say and my family heard me, I felt relief. I never have to do that again. Though working myself up into a lather was mostly for naught, as these things tend to go. But after the big reveal, which was not so much a bombshell as it was a tiny grenade, I felt a little hollow. I was so wrapped up in getting the telling right that I forgot about me. What did I actually want from the reveal, beyond just a basic exchange of information? And what I realized later is that I want to be treated differently. I need to be treated differently. When my dad asked me the question earlier about how the family should regard me in light of this new information, here's how I should have responded. I want to have this revelation inform how I'm considered. I want my particular brain to be taken into account. I want my neurobiology to be understood, if not embraced. But what I really want and have no business asking for 
is that all of my family's bad feelings about me, that I'm judgmental or aggressive or overly opinionated, be seen through this new lens. I don't want them to think of me as insolent or obnoxious. I don't want to be fixed in their brains as difficult or selfish. I want them to see how hard it's been for me and to really digest all the ways I have to fold myself into a little origami version of me just to appear normal. I want an abundance of empathy, and I want to be enveloped by it. And I want every little Lauren out there to have the same. And maybe over time, that can happen. But I suspect that before I am swaddled in compassion, I have to have compassion for myself. I have to accept who I am. I didn't ask to be this way, but I am this way all the same. I am a middle-aged autistic lesbian with too many houseplants, not enough self-control, and a whole lot of life left to live. Goddess willing, LOL. But in order to get on with the business of living, there's one more thing I have to do. I have to absolve myself. I have to send shame packing. I have to be okay to feel things. And I need to enlist the help of an ex-girlfriend, a dying squirrel, and a Grammy-nominated musician to make all that happen. You've been listening to The Loudest Girl in the World. It's hosted, written, and executive produced by me, Lauren Ober. Our senior producer is Ryder Alsop. Our associate producer is David Ja. Sophie Crane is our showrunner and senior editor. Jake Gorski is our mix engineer. Music composed by my autistic Kiwi pal, the inimitable Ladyhawk. Our artwork was created by the autistic illustrator Loretta Ipsum. The show was fact-checked by Andrea Lopez Cruzado, and our autism consultant is Sarah Caput. Our executive producers are Mia Lobel and Lital Molad. Big thanks to my family, Russ, Kathy, and RJ, for taking in all the hard things. Love you guys. And special thanks to Jessica Chamberlain and Heather Kenyon for sharing their hard things with us, even though we didn't end up using them. And thanks to you, friend, for listening. <laughs>